I'm Dr. Beverly Reed. And I'm Dr. Amber Klimczak. And we are Two, Two Peaks, Peaks in a Pod. Pod. Welcome back, everybody. It's another week, and we are ready to talk about some more fertility topics. And this time, Dr. K has a topic for me, yes. so I'm excited to hear what you've got for me. Yes. <laughs> okay, so by now, everyone yeah. knows that we're Friends fans, right? Yes. And I love games. Yes, yes. <laughs> so yes. there is one episode where Phoebe has her game that should not be used in anyone else's hands. Do you remember her game? Um, no. So it's basically rapid fire questions. Okay. You can't think. You just okay. have to you have to say exactly the first thing that comes to your mind oh, when you're no. choosing between the two options. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Now Everyone out there listening, Dr. Reed is going to hate this game. I know. Okay. I'm going to try to overthink yes, it, right? Yes, because <laughs> she is going to want to stop the game and say, wait, 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 I need I need to explain this choice yes. or you can't choose between those two. Yeah. So no choosing, no slowing down. You just have to answer and the I first can't thing. And explain why I chose this. First thing that comes after, afterwards. Okay. Afterwards. Oh, we're going to okay. talk about it afterwards. Okay. okay. First thing that comes to your mind. Okay. Okay. Are you ready for, no. I don't, what are we going to call this? Um, rapid fire fertility friends. Okay, rapid fire friends. Okay. <laughs> All right, ready? Yes. Fresh or frozen transfer? Frozen. One or two IUIs? Three. <laughs> <laughs> two. Okay, fine. Two. <laughs> progesterone and oil, intramuscular or vaginal progesterone? PIO. <laughs> Prometrium or endometrium? Prometrium. Microflare protocol or antagonist? Antagonist. Estrogen pills or patches? Ooh, patches. Kim or Chloe? Oh, Kim! <laughs> I'll throw that in there. Okay. Single embryo transfer or double embryo transfer? Oh, single. If it's see, the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a politically correct answer. Yes. ICSI or conventional IVF? ICSI. Provera's antagonist or Ganarelix? Ooh, Provera. Yeah. All right. I like it. Like it. Yeah. Letrozole or Clomid? Letrozole. Pre-implantation genetic testing for embryos or no pre-implantation genetic testing for PGT embryos. PGT for sure. Yeah. Saline sonogram or FemView? Oh, saline infusion sonogram for sure. <laughs> Lupron trigger or HCG trigger? Uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if I had to pick one HCG, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That, those, are, those are my rapid fire. Okay. We, we got through them quickly. Okay. okay. So okay. I feel like there's some good topics in here. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have yeah. a few friends that are going through fertility treatment right now. And oh, I, I know. you know. I feel like most of the questions that I get are just very like this or that, yeah. this or that, you know, and I, I want to send back a whole paragraph and they're like, no, just tell me <laughs> what I should do. So it is kind of yeah. nice to hear like what, like your quick response is. It is kind of funny. Cause I kind of feel like it's almost like this is my patience for me. You know, like when I'm in a room seeing patients, I get the rapid fire questions oh, yeah. too. Like, you know, what about this? What about this? And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes. <laughs> our patients definitely expect us to think quickly on our feet. So yes. So it's, yes. It's good, yeah. It's yeah. a good habit. We can practice with Phoebe's game. Yes, exactly. Perfect. Okay. So <laughs> let's talk about fresh versus frozen transfer. Okay. I think it's a good topic. And it is. I think it's such a good topic. It is sort of specific to IVF. So, yeah. if, you know, if someone out there listening is like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not even doing, you know, yeah. fertility treatment. So maybe this isn't super relevant. But maybe yeah. in the future, you might be interested. So. Absolutely. Well, it's really interesting. I just think because when you look at IVF as a whole, it changed dramatically when we in our field learned how to safely freeze embryos and thaw them. Um, so long ago, they used to do something that we now refer to as a slow freeze. And when you do a slow freeze, both to eggs or embryos, unfortunately, ice crystals can form, which can damage the um, embryos or the eggs. And, um, and so really, back in the olden days, this was not the ideal situation to ever have to unnecessarily freeze and then uh, thaw embryos and eggs. But then somebody invented vitrification, which is a fast freeze. It can freeze the eggs and embryos so fast that no ice crystals have a chance to form. And so it tends to be less damaging to eggs and embryos. And then that opened up a whole new world of being able to um, do uh, frozen embryo transfers and really have the same, if not better chances for success, depending on the patient's individual situation, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's kind of counterintuitive. Yeah. I don't know why, but in, you know, in medicine and science and bench research, you always think about someone being really meticulous mm -hmm. and going slowly and being very careful doing something. And as it turns out, freezing something very slowly mm -hmm. introduces yeah. this in huge issue that actually damages the embryo as mm -hmm. it's being frozen. And this is 
actually what my thesis was based off of. It was investigating ways in which we can increase the cooling rate when we freeze embryos or vitrify embryos. And so I think that there's still a lot to be discovered out there. We can get better. We can actually freeze them quicker Mm -hmm. and um, have less damage in the process. But yes, Dr. Reed is on point. Basically, once we introduce vitrification, now, you know, we're really, really good at freezing embryos and the thaw survival rate is great. Mm -hmm. So embryos do really well. They don't mind being frozen and they don't mind being thawed out. Prior to that, we were really having to time perfectly fresh embryo transfers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other thing is that I think when you first hear about it, well, do you want a fresh transfer or a frozen transfer, right? Mm -hmm. Fresh sounds better, right? (laughs) Everyone's like, fresh is better. We live in a world that everything that's fresh is better, right? But there's, you know, a huge extra explanation behind doing a fresh transfer. Yeah. A lot more is involved and it makes it actually a lot harder, Mm -hmm. I think, to time it properly. And um, we can talk a little bit about the dyssynchrony of the endometrium and and what happens and what the lining sees in terms of hormone levels. Yeah. And let's kind of even back up to and just explain for somebody who may not really know the difference between fresh and frozen. So we are referring to patients who are undergoing IVF and in vitro fertilization cycle. And so a fresh embryo transfer means that you're taking all of your fertility injections, you have your egg retrieval, and then shortly after your egg retrieval, maybe three to five days later, you're doing your embryo transfer right then and there. So that's what we call a fresh embryo transfer versus what probably most people are doing these days. A frozen embryo transfer means that at the time of the egg retrieval, we pull out the eggs and and um, start, you know, add the sperm to make the embryos. But really any embryos we get at that point, we just freeze and we're not putting them in um, until later. So definitely um, quite different in terms of the timeline. And I will say one of the advantages of a fresh transfer is it happens faster, right? That's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. With frozen, you do have to be more patient. Um, But I think the point with doing, uh, with being more patient is that we hope sometimes that you will have better chances um, of getting pregnant when compared to um, doing a fresh transfer. I will say these days, we probably know the number one reason why we end up doing frozen is because a lot of patients love to do embryo testing. Right. Yeah. So in order for us to genetically test your embryos, we can take a small sample of the embryos before we freeze them. And we send that sample off for genetic testing. Really, the purpose is to look and make sure the embryo has a full complement of genetics. But as a byproduct of that, we do get the gender of the embryos, which a lot of people are very interested in. That testing takes 10 days, two weeks to come back. And so you can see you can't do a fresh transfer because you won't have the information back. So we freeze the embryos and we wait for the genetic testing to come back. And then we're ready to do the transfer in the next cycle. Yes. And then, um, but I will say sometimes the reason we're freezing, even if somebody doesn't want to do genetic testing, is to lower the risk of complications that you can get um, when you're doing IVF. So as you're taking fertility injections and your follicles are growing nice and big, your follicles are where the eggs are going to come from, those follicles can produce very high levels of hormones and you can be at higher risk of getting what's called hyperstimulation syndrome. And really that means that your ovaries are so swollen and your hormones are so high that you can feel really sick after an egg retrieval. But we know if you just freeze the embryos and put them in later, your body's gonna recover a lot faster from that. Whereas if you do a fresh transfer, can make that a lot worse, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. When we do a fresh transfer and it's successful, mm-hmm. that's actually the worst scenario to be in because yeah. HCG, which is the hormone that your body produces when you're pregnant, feeds basically that hyperstimulation, that overstimulated state and makes it a lot worse. Mm-hmm. And so you can even get later onset, you know, hyperstimulation syndrome. Definitely don't want to be in that scenario. It's great to be pregnant, yes. right? But what Dr. Reed is describing is you're really bloated, you're uncomfortable, you're nauseous, you can't keep food down. So we try at all costs to avoid that. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the other reason sometimes we really want to freeze is because we want to get the ideal conditions to put an embryo in. So when you're doing IVF, you can kind of almost divide it into two parts the eggs and then the uterus where the pregnancy is going to implant. And if you know ahead of time you're going to be freezing everything, you can really kind of almost ignore the uterus. 
that always actually throws a lot of my patients off because maybe like in the olden days, you would have to like start your stimulation on a certain day of the cycle or whatever. And really in the modern day, you can start your stimulation any time of the cycle. And sometimes patients will even start their period in the middle of an IVF stimulation and they'll be so stressed about it. I say, don't worry about it. We don't, we don't care about your uterus right now. We're yeah. only focused on eggs right now. So that really kind of frees you up to just focus on the eggs. But if you're doing a fresh embryo transfer, it's totally different. You have to be focused on not only the eggs, but also the uterus. And there are some very specific things we look at during the monitoring to make sure you could be a candidate for a fresh transfer. Do you want to talk about some of the things we look at? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as you know, one thing to understand is as you're taking your injections, we're basically giving you extra hormone. Mm -hmm. And so your estrogen levels are going to rise. They're going to get really high. And so, you know, our really high responders, your estrogen level is going to be what we call like super physiologic, higher than normal for just a basic menstrual cycle. If you've been through IVF, you've probably seen your estrogen levels. Maybe your estrogen levels were even, you know, 2000, 3000. And definitely when you just have one follicle and you have a natural menstrual cycle, it's going to be much lower, probably closer to 200. And so your lining or your uterus is seeing that really high level. Okay. And so sometimes that can cause this dyssynchrony and basically affects the lining so that it's not on time with your embryo developing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, you know, certain criteria, probably the biggest criteria we look at is the progesterone level mm -hmm. and there's different you know, thresholds, but a lot of times the high responders also will have that early rise in the progesterone. And that basically means your lining is getting ready but your embryo still needs to grow in the lab and it's not ready yet. So lining's kind of out here, embryo's back here. So we're, we can't put the embryo in when the lining's not ready to receive it. Yeah. That's yeah. called dyssynchrony. A mm -hmm. lot of research going into that right now. Yeah. Um, but that's the basics of why often we just don't have a lot of control with a fresh transfer. We can't control when your lining is ready mm -hmm. and when the embryo is ready. If we're just growing the embryo and then freezing it, we can grow the lining and time everything perfectly. Mm -hmm. What progesterone cutoff do you use? I use 1.5. It, that's as as it's less. Than so I don't do them. Okay, okay. <laughs> but that's what I was yeah. taught yeah. Yeah. to yeah. like pass my boards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. So, um, so we're looking at the progesterone level. Um, so, you know, let's say I hypothetically have a patient says, I really want to do a fresh transfer. Then sometimes I'll go into it and say, okay, we can see if that's an option, but these are the things I'm going to be looking for to make sure you're a candidate. So is your progesterone level less than 1.5? I also want to know about the thickness of the lining. So since the lining is, is going to be where the embryo is going to implant, we want a nice, thick, fluffy lining. Um, a good example of this, because sometimes people worry after we do an embryo transfer, what if it falls out? Okay. And, you know, when they even walk out of the clinic, they're just like walking so carefully. And, and But here's what we say is imagine you have a piece of toast and you take a grain of rice and you put it on the toast and you flip over the toast, that grain of rice is going to fall right off. But imagine if you take that piece of toast, you put peanut butter on it, you put the grain of rice there, then you take another piece of toast with peanut butter on it like this. Okay. That's what you're like. So your lining is the peanut butter here. So we're trying <laughs> like, to get wait, where's the lining? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you're, we're trying to get you to grow lots of peanut butter. So that little embryo is going to be trapped in there really well. Okay. Because at that point, that green rice is not going to go anywhere. Right. And so, um, so we want you to have a nice thick lining. You will hear different numbers that people use as cutoffs. I use seven, but I will say even, I mean, seven's the minimum, but really even eight might be nicer. So let's say I'm, I'm looking at um, the patient's lining and, and they can only get to say 6.9. I'm probably going to be like, I think we can do better. Let's just freeze the embryos and then we'll go ahead and put them in later. What lining cutoff do you use? I use seven yeah. in a general cycle, yeah. but again, I'm greedy. So, yeah. you know, and it's easy when we're doing a frozen embryo transfer yeah. cycle. If I bring them in, I was expecting for them to have a nice thick lining and it's like right on the border. And we're, we haven't been on estrogen that long. I'm just like, hey, let's let your lining see a little bit more estrogen. Let's push it out. I actually had a patient like that this week. Yeah. And then let's recheck it. And hopefully she comes back and it's 8.5, yeah. 9. Because yeah. there's two aspects of making your lining grow. One is the fuel, mm -hmm. which is estrogen. Mm -hmm. And one is the time that your lining actually sees that fuel. And so it's not just like, for example, with we just talked about you're, you're doing injections for IVF. You're going to do a fresh transfer. Your estrogen levels 
really high. I mean, it's through the roof. It's 2000, you know, so your lining has plenty of fuel, Mm -hmm. but it may not have plenty of time that it was exposed to it. Mm -hmm. We have a lot more flexibility when we're doing the frozen transfer to just extend it. Press Mm -hmm. transfer, if your lining is less than seven, when it's time to go, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I would imagine then that's a cancellation. Yeah. 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 And then the other thing we really like to look at is the pattern. So whenever we're, you know, doing the ultrasound, we try to assess the pattern. And ideally, we're looking for what's called a trilimiter pattern. I usually like to show my patients the three lines and say, that's really the pattern we're shooting for. If you don't have a perfect trilimiter pattern, then again, I'd say, you know what? Why risk it? Why don't we freeze the embryos, try a frozen cycle instead, where we're going to have more time um, to be able to make adjustments to your lining if needed. It is sort of interesting, you know, sometimes we do have patients that mm-hmm. their lining just doesn't get thick enough, yeah. you know, it doesn't develop in response to estrogen. Mm-hmm. And one of my Hail Marys that mm-hmm. I'll do yeah. is a stimulation yeah, is actually sure. just similar to, you know, what we do with IVF. So have you ever seen a patient that's going okay. through, you know, fresh stimulation mm-hmm. and their estrogen levels are really high yeah. and they're, you know, ready to do their retrieval and you look and their lining's like six. Mm-hmm. 5.5. And then you go and do the frozen transfer and it was just that they needed more time. Like did, do they do a lot better? I mean, what I've just been fascinated by is the differences Mm -hmm. in how people were well respond to different medications and nobody is the same. So I've had some patients that respond to pills, but not patches Mm -hmm. or patches, but not pills or neither, but they respond to stimulation medication. So I definitely see it all the time. Um, I will say too, this, one of my publications was looking at the lining during both fresh and um, Mm -hmm. frozen in patients that were doing mini stem cycles. So for mini stem cycles, this is a type of stimulation where you're taking Clomid for 10 days. Now Clomid is a great medication to stimulate the ovaries to grow eggs, but Clomid can have a side effect of causing the lining to be too thin. And so we took the same patient and we compared her lining from when she did her Clomid mini stem to when she did her frozen embryo transfer. And the frozen embryo transfer lining was so much better, so much thicker, much better pattern and and all the rest of it. And so we really felt like that concluded that if you're doing a mini stem cycle, you really should always do a freeze all those cases, Mm -hmm. whether you're testing or not. So that's a really good point. Interesting Mm -hmm. publication. Yeah. (laughs) Um, and then, okay, so a couple of other things though, I wanted to talk about. So for fresh embryo transfer, you know, first, let's say you're interested in one. I think the first thing is to ask, does your doctor do that? Right? Cause as Dr. K says, she doesn't do fresh embryo transfers. And I think you're probably going to find that increasing these days because I would say it's almost like they've gone out of style, right? <laughs> yeah. I, it depends on where you trained and yeah. kind of when you trained, yeah. you know, I, trade much more recently yeah. and we're doing a lot of genetic testing. And so a lot of centers have converted to what we call freeze all centers. Mm-hmm. And so that means that lab pretty much doesn't have the option of doing fresh transfers. There's also a lot of, you know, other behind the scenes work that yeah. it takes for the embryologist mm-hmm. and everyone involved to facilitate fresh transfers mm-hmm. and they may not be prepared to do that. So definitely mm-hmm. a question to ask the facility, the physician before, yeah. um, and, you know, maybe ask around, like, what is it? And, you know, is it that you're wanting to be pregnant on the first cycle? Yeah. Sometimes like you have to evaluate what's your motivation. Yeah. Why do you not want a frozen transfer? Yeah. So or sometimes you. I will say I've seen people do both where, um, so I've had patients before where they'll say, you know what, maybe I'll do a fresh transfer of my first embryo mm-hmm. and I want to do PGT mm-hmm. on the rest of the embryos and of course freeze them um, for later. So sometimes you'll even people see people who were off for both. But again, I would say probably 90% of my patients are choosing to do embryo testing these days. And I think you probably have a similar mm-hmm. oh, yeah. too, right? Definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We talk a lot. I think it's just a lot about counseling. And yeah. to me, like embryos are just so valuable. And so mm-hmm. if I think there's like any chance that we're going to do better, you know, I, I just, you know, perfectionism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I think it was a good point about not everybody may be able to accommodate a fresh transfer. So I guess we can just kind of touch on that too. So um, some areas, especially probably more rural areas, um, they may not be able to have an embryologist on site every single day of the month. Um, And so they may batch cycles, meaning that they fly an embryologist in at certain intervals to be able to run their cycles. But because you only have that embryologist for a certain period of time, it could be that when you're transfer would fall, the embryologist would be gone. And, and in that case, it's just not an option. So again, it's very kind of clinic dependent on, on what all the options could be there. 
Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing I think it's really important to just know when you're going into an IVF cycle is you want to have these things figured out, whether you would even be open to doing a fresh during a frozen, because that can change some of the medications that you use during your cycle. So I would say you really got me um, <laughs> started on um, a new technique that I love. So whenever you're doing your IVF stimulation, you usually have your stimulation medications. And those are the medications we use to help grow those follicles to be nice and big. But as they grow big, you want to make sure that they don't ovulate too soon. And Previously, I was using an injection that a patient would have to take every single day to keep that ovulation. Worst IVF shot yeah, yeah it's cause it, it burns, if you've been through right? IVF, you know what this is. It burns, <laughs> causes redness, it's yeah. irritating. Yeah, I'm and so we glad to cut it out. Mention any brand names, right? <laughs> yeah, but but um, and sometimes we still have to use that. But um, it, but you taught me that we can instead use a pill instead of an injection, um, in order to keep the ovulation from happening. So this is medroxyprogesterone that keeps you from ovulating. But I will tell you, because it is progesterone. You can't use it if you want to do a fresh transfer because it would be sending a signal to the uterus to become receptive at the incorrect time. So we can only use this medication on people who are planning to do a freeze all cycle. Do your patients love it? Yes. They love it. Yeah. And yeah. actually, some of my patients that have cycled with me before mm -hmm. are kind of confused because they're like, wait, what's this medication? And why do I not have as many injections and all the rest? And I'm like, you can thank Dr. K. <laughs> I've, getting I've, had a few patient, to I've had a few patients that have cycled previously as yeah. well. And mm -hmm. they're like, I feel like I'm doing way fewer medications because yeah. like they might have been doing a flare or two. Yeah. You know, so you just like never know what type of protocol that they're doing. Yes. I think it's been a great, great addition. And it's cheaper too. Yes. That's the other yeah. advantage of using medroxyprogesterone. If you're out there and you're yeah. about to start an IVF cycle and you're worried about cost, I think you should definitely inquire, ask your physician mm -hmm. about medroxyprogesterone as an antagonist. Mm -hmm. there, this data has been around for, I think, since 2008 now. This is not new. It's safe. It's effective. There's so many studies to show that it works um, and functions really well to prevent ovulation. And if you're needle phobic, one less mm -hmm. shot price. It's just, there's all around goodness. Yeah. Same yeah. thing though to consider mm -hmm. is converting to an insemination cycle. Like yeah, if you anticipate someone's going to be like a low uh, responder. So sometimes yeah. when we're doing an IVF cycle and you don't have enough follicles to develop, we may give you the option to actually switch and convert mm -hmm. to an insemination instead of pr proceeding with your egg retrieval. Mm -hmm. And if we have already given you progesterone, then the lining is, the timing is off. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Um, and so, yeah, if for some reason I have somebody who really wants to do it fresh, then instead of the medroxyprogesterone, I'll go back to our usual medication. It's called a GnRH antagonist um, medication that that you would take. And that is able to keep you from ovulating while also not affecting the receptivity um, of the uterus. Yeah. Okay. Should we switch to another topic or do you want to hear my well, social... I was going to mention one more thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So I, I know there's a lot of early testers out there, right? Oh. So um, if you're doing a fresh transfer, it does make it hard to be an early tester, right? Mm -hmm. Because a, a most time or in most cases, you're going to want to um, use a HCG trigger to do your um, egg retrieval. Well, HCG is pregnancy hormone, right? And so let's say you go to do your transfer and yes, your doctor has you scheduled for your blood test when it's supposed to be, but you're cheating and testing at home, which is always okay with me when my patients do that, but you're going to get a positive because you took your trigger injection anyway. So that can make it a little bit harder to, to tell um, as well when you're doing fresh transfer. So I just thought I would throw that out. <laughs> I was a cheater. You were okay. Always. Yeah. Which, I mean, honestly, I would do the same yeah. too. <laughs> Always. Um, so I, I do have a, a video. Oh, okay. Of something. And you're going to have okay. to tell me because this is how uncool I am. I don't, okay. know, I don't even know what show it's from. Okay. <laughs> it's something fertility related though. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me open it up. So one of my friends sent this to me so that I can be as cool as Dr. Reed and knowing what's happening on these trending shows. <laughs> She actually sent me two. Okay. Ah, uh, Roni again. Wait, no. No, it's not, not Roni. Okay. Oh, yeah, it is Roni. It is Roni. Okay. okay. See? Roni. And I always feel bad because I like haven't really been following along with Roni, but I yeah. hear that there's been fertility stuff happening. Yeah. It, so. 
It's expensive. Okay. The way a woman says about it, it kind of scares everybody. Yeah. It's really not. You just need a, a good three weeks and you can do it. And it's fine. And it's fine. You don't when I went in for the intake, though, they start educating me. They're like, well, you know, not just breathing eggs. Ember is the best. And on the intake form, can you just write down who you'd like to do embryos with? Ooh. Embryos are more viable. Wait, what? 20 minutes in. The no, they didn't do that. They made me like, say the name. I'm going to okay, give you my doctor. doctor. So I'm going to go through my phone and I'm like, yo. So I've never heard that. I had a name. How many? Oh, but that's what you're like. I'm a girl's girl, and I have so many girlfriends, and I've just never heard of a location asking for you to go through your phone contact list and hit up some guys to give you some jizz for an embryo. Oh God! I love you. I don't want to hear sorry about the embryo. What? <laughs> okay, so basically, so is that just friend? reminded me of something too. I need yeah. to tell you about her Instagram video we posted oh last gosh. night. The one of you with the Amazon packages yeah. walking by. So some very nice colleague of mine texted me and she was like, hey, just so you know, like the music that you posted it to is highly inappropriate. <laughs> what is it? Well, I can't say. <laughs> well, you know, I haven't heard it. it. Well, it's in Spanish. I'm like, you know, oh, it's in Spanish. I yes. Did. Okay, here's my thing. And I tell, I tell Dr. Reed this. I am like a nut about keeping my phone on silent because I have like young kids and everything. So my Instagram, if you ever post something with sound, I have no idea what it is. Like, you have to have captions. I don't have sound on ever. Okay. So well, I didn't even know it had music. <laughs> Well, I'll let you watch it later, oh, and we'll see how that a thought disappointed in me. <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know how to just change the sound, so I'm hoping like most people just won't notice and realize. But, okay. but anyways, I don't know why that made me So this that person bad. was fluent in Spanish and yes. interpreted yeah. what yeah. we she were... I didn't even know it was Spanish, and, and so she was like, yeah, no, it's... It what doesn't la what say language what you think did you it think it was? I don't even know. <laughs> And because oh here's God. the thing, like I'm trying to be trendy, like the young kids. And this is like on TikTok, you have like sounds that you use. This is one of the very popular sounds that everybody uses on their videos. So I just use that. I yes. Know, but, so side yeah. note, shout out to Kennedy. Kennedy is my very trendy medical assistant. Yeah. She told me that I need to use more trending sounds on my Instagram. And I was like, excuse me, what are trending sounds? And she said, oh, just go to Dr. Reed's. You'll see. I'm like, okay. So Dr. Reed well, is very with it. We'll have to ask Kennedy if she knew it was inappropriate because they should have told us. Like, yeah. we need somebody supervising us before yeah, we, we do. get on Instagram. We definitely okay. need someone to have some way to supervise us. Okay, so this um, okay, video. Yeah. So first of all, I think this girl's name is Erin. Okay. Right? Is that okay. correct? Yeah, I mean, that she's, sounds right. Yeah. She's um, very attractive, yeah. you know, um, New York housewife, I guess. Yeah. And she and her girlfriends are talking at lunch one day about going and freezing your eggs. Yeah. And, you know, I feel similarly, like if you go out with a group yeah. of girlfriends nowadays, most people have inquired or know a little bit about egg freezing. Yeah. But I guess Erin is saying when she walked into the clinic... On her intake form, they were requiring that she say who she's going to make embryos with and that egg freezing really wasn't as good and that she needed to pick out a partner <laughs> off of her phone contacts. So first of all, have you ever heard of this at any IVF center that you know? Never. But I think I know what the issue is, which mm -hmm. is that... She went to a fertility clinic and realized that the vast majority of our patients at a fertility clinic are trying to get pregnant. And so they probably just gave her the questionnaire they give to everybody else saying, like, who's your partner? Who are you trying to get pregnant with or whatever? And I think it's a good point that we do need to be more sensitive to all the different, you know, situations patients may be in when they come to see us. And I do think that's hard because it's not like you necessarily have 40 different packets of like, well, if you're here to see us for this, fill out this one. If you're here to see us for that, you know, fill out that one. So I think it was more that she just she didn't got a understand standard, that, right? She got some standard paperwork. <laughs> some standard paperwork, right? But that would make for some interesting phone calls. Okay, shots fired. Erin, if you're out there, Dr. Yeah. Reed says you're lying. No. She, she <laughs> agrees with, with your friends. They did not ask you. I am not trying to get an erroneous with anybody, okay? Because I will lose. I could not. I cannot. <laughs> Here's the thing. You know, I don't watch the show, but mm -hmm. my friend had sent me all these clips. Mm -hmm. And then I just was like going down this rabbit hole. I yeah. was just like, what? Yeah. I would be at stoplights. And I'm like, oh, this is like pretty good. <laughs> so, so now I can understand why people watch the show. so good. 
right. I'm glad we're like getting you hooked now. <laughs> um, and I feel like too, I wasn't that into Roni, but maybe I just need to get into Roni. It sounds like they talk a lot about fertility. So this is like homework for me. There right? were like three different ones from, yeah. this, from, okay. from Roni about fertility. Yeah, so yeah, but I think, you know, going off this, I think we yeah. have probably talked about this before, but you know, there are two options when you're thinking about fertility mm-hmm. preservation. You can definitely do egg freezing mm-hmm. or you can do embryo freezing if you have a sperm source that you're interested in using. Maybe that's donor sperm. Maybe that's someone that you know that you're not necessarily in a relationship with a known donor, or you're in a relationship with someone and you want to use their sperm, you can make embryos with them. So we do all of the above. There are, there is no random person off of your phone required to do fertility, fertility preservation. You can do it all on your own. Yes. And even if you're trying to get pregnant and you don't have a partner, we can help with that too. We are a huge supporter of single mothers by choice. Um, and so we can help you through which, whichever situation. Um, but I will tell you too, this made me think of a scenario where I do think in retrospect, I could have done a better job of really listening to my patient. Okay. So I had a couple come in, they had a child together already, you know, maybe three or four years old. And they said, you know, we don't want to have another child right now, but I think she was maybe like 40 or something. Mm-hmm. They're like, we're going to want another child. And so we want to freeze some eggs is what they said. And I said, mm-hmm. well, hmm. Here's the thing, and we can kind of explain this again, too. I think we've explained it before, but I think it's worth going over. An egg is just one cell, whereas an embryo is many cells. And if you freeze an egg versus an embryo, it is true. An embryo has a better chance of surviving that freeze and thaw because it has so many cells. If that embryo during the freeze and thaw lost a couple cells, it's probably still going to do fine. But with an egg, because you only had one cell, it can sometimes have more difficulty surviving that process. So if I have a patient in a situation like I'm describing to you, I say, look, I hear you telling me you want to freeze eggs, but I really recommend you freeze embryos instead because they are going to survive the freeze and the thaw um, so much better. And I kept kind of getting a lot of pushback and I kind of was thinking maybe they just didn't understand or, or something like that. And I really just kept trying to reiterate that. Um, and ultimately she ended up not deciding not to do it, um, either way, but then she did reach out to me maybe about six months later and of course, okay. And Mm. then I felt really bad because that didn't really occur to me in that moment. Like just from my perspective, it was the first time I've meeting them. They have a child together. I was just so focused on probably everything's great. Right. But no, like she was trying to tell me, I to preserve my fertility for the future. Maybe it's with him. Maybe it's with a new partner, you know? And so I always kind of felt guilty about that, but I think it's a good learning point for any of us. Such is like, a good you reminder. never know what someone's going through in that situation. And even if they're making a choice that may not seem like it makes sense, there could be a very good reason. Right. And mm-hmm. I mean, it is wonderful that we can have autonomy, you know, as women, yeah. we can just freeze eggs. And, yeah. you know, Dr. Reed and I were getting together our IVF consents for our lab. Mm-hmm. And along with that, we have all these designations for if you create embryos with someone else, okay, yeah. what's the disposition of those embryos? Mm-hmm. Because the ownership really lies in both parties. And you've probably seen there's been media cases and things like this over embryo ownership. It's very complicated. Mm-hmm. When, when we really started to sit down and go over these consents, there are so many different scenarios Mm -hmm. where you really need to think about if you're planning to make embryos with someone for the purpose of fertility preservation, you're not using them immediately, or, you know, you're doing it for IVF and you're going to have super numerary or extra embryos to use in the future. Mm -hmm. What will you guys want to do with them Mm -hmm. in every scenario in the event of death, divorce, Mm -hmm. separation, you know, there's a lot of Mm -hmm. different scenarios. And I always kind of feel like women get the short end of the stick here. I don't know if you do, but here's why, you know, women, our fertility window is fixed, right? There's a certain point where we're not going to be able to have any more children with our own eggs and men don't really have that. Yeah. And so it is, you know, if you're doing something for fertility preservation Mm -hmm. and then you don't have ownership of those embryos later because you're not in that relationship or something happened, well, the man can just go on and have a baby, you know, he can still use his sperm and that's not always the case for women. So it is kind of frustrating, I think, to imagine those scenarios. Yeah. Especially the cases that I've heard that have made the news where the female partner had cancer Mm -hmm. and, you know, they froze embryos together before she got her chemotherapy. 
Then she had her chemotherapy. She's ready to have a baby, but they're divorced. All, her only chance at that point um, is to use those frozen embryos and her ex-husband won't let her use them. Like, I mean, it's a heartbreaking situation for sure. Yeah, it's, com- it's complex. Yeah, yeah sure. It's very yeah. complex. So, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, something to be thoughtful about if you're planning to go through this with someone else. Yeah. Okay, should we wrap it up for the week? Yes, yeah, so this is a great subject matter, huh? Yeah, like my rapid did, fire. Right, that's right. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I think we only talked about a couple of them. Maybe we yeah. save some of the other ones for um, next week. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone, okay, have a good week. Thank you. Bye.